Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk on VPC design. I have the distinct honor of being the only thing standing between you and an open bar. <laughs> I don't know why they put VPC design at the end of the day, but truly, thank you for coming. Um, I hope I hold up to the challenge. Uh, we have a lot to cover in an hour, so let's get started. The first thing is, all the use cases, configurations, designs, everything you see in here is real. It's not theoretical. There's nothing that uh, I made up and tried out. It all comes from customer use cases. Um, so my goal here is really to empower you with uh, what I consider good VPC design practices. My name is Rob Alexander. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. We're going to go through a story of simple VPC all the way up to very complex VPCs. And along the way, I'm going to share with you customer use cases, best practices, tips and tricks, hopefully things that you can take back with you and uh, can be immediately useful to you. I come from a networking background. Uh, infrastructure design is the favorite part of my job. But in my old life, I used to do design, and then I'd spend months and months living in a data center, racking, stacking, wiring. In my new life, with VPC, I design and I deploy at equal speed. By the way, I blew all my visual effects budget on that one shot, so <laughs> the rest of this is going to be like shadow puppets. <laughs> uh, Andy talked about agility yesterday in, in the keynote. And uh, coming from infrastructure and networking background, uh, agility is usually not the first thing that uh, our side of the house was associated with. But uh, VPC really unleashes experimentation and creativity at the networking stack. It uh, enables rapid adaptation to your evolving business needs. And it really emphasizes to me the power of programmable infrastructure. So to get started on VPC, I'm actually going to plug CloudFormation. Uh, my little uh, cloud light bulb guide is a indicator that this is a tip, so tip number one. Um, a quick word on CloudFormation, and this is particularly to those of you in the crowd that are network engineers, systems engineers, infrastructure architects, and most of you app guys are probably all over this already. Um, being able to source control and, and version control your data center is just extremely powerful. To be able to put in a, in a single place, in a single configuration template, everything that defines your networking stack, everything from the routing rules, the subnets, the security groups, and then the actual groups that manage them too, all in one place, to be rapidly deployed, to be identical, and to be version controlled so that you can go back and forth at will and then reproduce the same structure in other locations around the world. And finally, this is something I'm going to come back to quite a bit in this talk, is, is the idea of segregation of duties uh, in infrastructure, particularly around security control. So CloudFormation very easily lets you uh, dictate those groups that are responsible for the infrastructure templates that lay the foundation of your network versus your application teams that might have their own templates, their own stacks, that they would build upon those infrastructure plates. And then separate teams would maintain those templates. So elements of VPC design. Uh, obviously, this talk is intended for folks who already know a few things about VPC. So I am going to spend a few minutes talking about the, the fundamental elements that make up the VPC. Uh, but hopefully, I'm going to talk about them in a way that you know, maybe you haven't heard before. So we'll start with one. A VPC is an isolated private segmentation of the AWS cloud where you dictate all of the networking configuration within it. You bring your own network into the cloud. When you create a VPC, it stretches across all regions, I mean, all, excuse me, all availability zones in the region. And there's only one creation decision when you create a VPC, and that's what IP space to assign to it. So for our first VPC, we've chosen 10.1, a 16-bit subnet mask. 16-bit subnet mask is actually the largest CIDR block you can assign to a VPC. And we introduce our first subnets. Now, subnets, unlike the VPC itself, are AZ-specific. 
And they're also where you define both routing policy and security policy for your network. But we'll talk about that in a minute. At subnet creation, at the actual API creation of a subnet, there's only three things you designate, and that's the VPC itself, where the subnet's going to exist, the CIDR block, and the availability zone. So tip number two is think about your IP space before you create it. Um, unfortunately, I've had too many customers who started spawning more and more VPCs, perhaps giving them the same CIDR blocks, and then down the road wanted those VPCs to talk to themselves, talk to each other. And obviously, with overlapping IP space, it creates an enormous headache. So think about your space in advance. Um, make sure you've designed and considered expansion plans, whether that's in the region itself, so maybe you only deploy to two AZs at first, and then later down the road, you might grow to more AZs. Make sure you've allocated space for each AZ. You want equal dis distribution of your IP space across all AZs in a region. And then if you add more regions, or particularly if you extend it into your corporate network, you want to make sure that all these AP spaces are distinct, and down the road, you won't have headaches. And this is particularly important with subnet design. You know, I have some customers with very large dynamic workloads who are perfectly comfortable with one large subnet in an AZ. They run thousands and thousands and thousands of hosts in a subnet. The traditional networking restraints, things like spanning tree protocol or broadcast domains, these don't apply here. You don't have to worry about that. So use the subnet as you would for your design and not a physical networking constraint that you're used to. So back to our subnets. And the most common separation of, of or logical isolation of subnet tights is the private and the public. The idea is that a public subnet is going to contain instances that eventually would be assigned public IPs and be able to transit out of the VPC. But at this point, they're just names. Um, there's nothing inherent with public and private that, that makes it that way. There's still a few more pieces we need to add before these can actually mean anything. So let's assign some CIDR blocks, launch some instances. So we've got in the public, we've got a dot .1, a dot .2. In the private, we've got a dot .3 and a dot .4. All 24-bit subnet masks, just to make it easy on me. So by default, every subnet can talk to every other subnet. And this is enabled by a virtual router that sits in a star topology between all the subnets. To get to this router, the VPC DHCP service hands out a dot one address as a local default gateway for the subnet. So that everything's pointing there within that subnet. So what happens then as soon as it gets to the star? That's when the subnet's assigned routing table comes into play. Now, I mentioned before when you create a subnet that you don't actually designate the routing table or security policy upon creation. So by default, when you create subnets, they're all assigned to a default main routing table. Yeah? So that routing table looks like this. It has a local route, and that route is actually what defines the star. So that local route is what enables all the intra subnet routing. So if that's the case, it should be apparent that you don't actually define intra-routing between the subnets. And what you're really doing with routing tables in a VPC is defining the ways out of the VPC. So I wanted to mention this as tip number three, is leave the main route alone. Uh, it's assigned to every subnet upon creation. If you go and start editing the main route table, for example, putting routes in there to the public or the private, it might not be a route that you want your subnet to have. So just leave it alone, leave the default route in there, and make sure you're editing with unique routing tables after the subnet creation. Uh, and you'll notice here, uh, it's, you know, it's reporting that it's associated with zero subnets. That's obviously not true. Um, all four of our subnets are associated with this table, but that's unique to the main routing table, because by default, anything that is not associated with any other routing table is going to be associated with this one. So the local route, it can't be edited, it can't be deleted, and you also can't define a route that's more specific than it. So in this case, 
We tried to put a route into subnet 3's routing table that says get to subnet 1 through an instance in subnet 2, right? Like that. And obviously this, is, this fails. It's not allowed. So uh, before we talk about the ways in and out of a VPC, I wanted to talk a little bit about network security, which in a VPC takes the form of network ACLs and security groups. Now, you're probably already fam familiar with security groups, but I wanted to point out some of the key differences between the two. So network ACLs are applied to subnets themselves. They're stateless, so quite rigid. You have to define traffic both going in and coming out. They're allow and deny lists rules, so you can actually have blacklists. And the rules themselves are processed in the order that you make them. So it's very important as a best practice, if you're using NACLs, to put your most commonly matched rules at the top. Security groups, on the other hand, are applied to elastic network interfaces themselves, which are attached to instances. You can have up to five security groups per instance, I mean per interface. They're stateful firewalls, so you don't have to define the traffic in both directions. They're allow only rules on security groups. The rules are all evaluated as a whole and a decision is made. And finally, which I think is the best feature of security groups, is that within a VPC, so security groups within a VPC only exist within that VPC, but they can reference each other. So you don't have to worry about designating IP spaces and rules uh, between different security groups in a VPC. So you can use a security group and a rule as a source and destination for that rule in another security group. Allows you to very uh, easily segment your application into components that can refer to each other. And we'll see that a lot in the designs we look at. So what are NACLs really good for? Uh, in general, they're good for a, as a baseline catch-all for screw-ups. So if a security group is either misassigned to a server by a DevOps group, or maybe it's misconfigured to, to, to begin with, or the wrong one is applied. It's a good catch-all for those kinds of things. And again, it's a segregation of duties between those that are responsible for implementing a security policy for the network itself and a security policy for servers. So best practices with VPCs. Since they do introduce a degree of complexity and the fact that they are stateless, I always advise to use them quite sparingly. Keep it simple. Simple is good. Egress security rules are best. That's so you don't have to turn around and define a whole bunch of ephemeral ports that have to be let back out. Create some rules with uh, you know, evenly spaced, 100, 200, 300, just to make room for those uh, extra ones you think up of later after you forget. And the last one is particularly important. Um, Use IAM, Identity and Access Management, to control who can edit your NACLs. And this is ex extremely important for those of you who decide not to use NACLs, because guess what? Every single your, one of your subnets has the default NACL applied to it, whether you like it or not. So this is the default NACL. It has one rule. It's allow all. So it's basically out of the way, unless someone comes along and pushes that button. Right? <laughs> guess what that does? Yeah. Your whole VPC is now shut down. So tip number four is create a network administration group, an IAM VPC group. High blast radius VPC API calls like the ones listed here, things that could bring down your whole virtual data center, put those in that group and make sure the right folks have access to those and not everyone. You know, the same kind of processes and procedure that you would do for a core router in a data center, that's the same degree of, uh, that you should look at here. Um, and the, the delete rules here, the seven, are now enabled for resource permissions. So this is something you're seeing more and more as we're rolling out EC2-based resource permissions. It means you can be very granular with uh, the IAM policy. You know, before, if you gave someone, for example, the Attach Internet Gateway API, you couldn't say, this person can only attach a internet gateway to this VPC. But with the delete rules, you now can. You can say, this group can only delete rules for this VPC. And this is an example of, that, of a policy like that. So this is giving the action for delete network, network ACL, 
or to modify an echo, only to uh, where the, there's a tag on that echo that says environment equal to prod. And for the extra paranoid, there's two little extra lines down there at the bottom. I mean, you actually have to have an active multi-factor authentication token also before you can execute this. So this would work in the actual management console. You would apply this to the group. If you did not log into the management console with an MFA, you would not be able to execute this rule. So back to ways out. There are two elements that can be added to a VPC that allow instances in the VPC to get outside the network. The first is what I call the public door, or the internet gateway, IGW. And you attach an IGW to a VPC in a one-to-one -one relationship. You can only have one IGW per VPC. And although it's called a gateway, the IGW is not one physical thing. In the VPC networking stack, the IGW is a, is a logical construct uh, that gives you the capability for transmit out of the out of a VPC. But just assigning and attaching an IGW to a VPC does not mean that all of a sudden everything can go out. But it's important to not think of it as something you have to manage for availability or bandwidth. It's not one physical box that all your traffic is going through. So the second is the private door the back door, the virtual private gateway, or VGW. VGWs are where you logically attach VPN tunnels or direct connect connections back to your colo, back to your on-premise data centers. And they, again, are a one-to-one -one relationship with a, with a VPC. But unlike the IGW, while the VGW is still a logical construct in the VPC networking stack, it eventually boils down to physical connections. So you have to make sure your VPN tunnels are available. You have to make sure your private connections are redundant. So here we can see we had a, a route for the dot four subnet, which points for any corporate siders, any private siders, point it to the VGW. You sign that routing table to that subnet. Any traffic destined for your internal network will now go to the VGW. There you go. So back to uh, public network access and IGW. We've assigned to IGW, but there's actually two more pieces that have to be in place before we can actually get anywhere. The first one is you need a route to the IGW. So here we've assigned the default gateway or the default route to the IGW. It doesn't have to be the default. You could define very specific networks that were allowed to go out through the IGW, but in this case, we're going to keep it simple. And the second thing you need is a public IP address. In AWS, there's two ways to assign public IPs. The first one you're probably well familiar with. It's been around for quite a while, and that's elastic IPs. And I like, I like to think of I elastic IPs as if you need to maintain a specific IP address that needs to be reached from the outside, use elastic IPs. You'll be able to maintain that elastic IP. You can assign it between instances. You can move it around. It's very dynamic. But you'll always be guaranteed to have that IP address fronting. The opposite of that is actually quite a new feature that was released a few months ago, um, which you might have missed in our flurry of announcements. But it's actually, to the networking guys, quite important. Um, and th this is to allow the automatic assignment of public IPs on instance launch. So it's very similar to how classic EC2 works, where you have a private and a public automatically assigned. If you stop that instance, there's a good chance you could lose that public IP. But for any situations where you actually don't need to persist a public IP coming in, you just need to talk out, this is a great feature. It enables a lot of the use cases we'll see today. So we have the three pieces in place. IGW, route table to the IGW, public IP, and we're out, finally. But there's also a lot of services beyond just the internet that live in public AWS that must be reached outside the VPC. So here's some examples of those kinds of 
services. Obviously, any AWS API endpoint is actually a public endpoint. So think about any API calls you're making from within your VPC, whether it's to EC2 endpoints to make EIP adjustments, whether it's to SQS or auto-scaling calls. All those things have to get out of your VPC onto the public network. Regional services like S3 and DynamoDB, DynamoDB, excuse me. Also, regional services, public endpoints, you have to get out of the VPC. And last, software and patch repositories. Amazon Linux actually enforces that you only access it through our IP addresses. And finally, what if an instance in a private subnet needs to get out? It doesn't have a route out. It doesn't have a public IP. And this is where NAT instances come into play. So NAT, Network Address Translation, is where you use an instance to front the connections for these private instances. It has a public IP, fronts that connection, and allows them to hide behind that single NAT instance. The NAT instance itself has a route out, and you can go out. And actually, we call it an app function, but it's actually PAT, word address translation. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's, it's one IP address hiding many privates behind it. So this is an example of what the route would look like. Default route for that subnet is now pointing to the NAT instance. And those private instances can now talk out. So tip number five is you know, we provide a NAT AMI for you. But I just wanted to point out there's actually nothing really special about it. You can run your own NAT. Pretty much any operating system will do it. We have lots of virtual appliances and partners that provide uh, much more advanced security appliances that do the same functionality. But the commands here listed are actually all we do to turn this into a NAT. So. Other private subnets can obviously share the same route table and be able to get out. But as traffic grows and grows, you have a single NAT. That NAT is an EC2 instance that has a very limited amount of bandwidth. You know, it's just one guy with a lot of guys talking to it. It's kind of starting to be a bottleneck. And as it gets more and more, obviously, you're going to melt that instance. Yeah. So how do you make scalable and available NAT? I'm not going to directly answer that question first. I'm going to divert it a little bit. Because now with this public, automatic public IP assignment, it enables some uh, removal of the headaches that used to exist why folks would use the NATs for everything. So think about if your bandwidth intensive processes actually need to be behind a NAT. Can they be separated out and be put into what you would consider the public subnets, given automatic I IP addresses, and be able to talk directly out? You know, there's security groups can control that there's actually no access to these servers from the outside in, but it does allow them to talk full instance bandwidth out to things like S3, which is my number one customer use case, multi-multi gigabit streams out of the VPC, talking to S3 through a NAT. It doesn't work well. So you want to make sure that you're getting the full bandwidth of that instance out if you're doing things like massive multi-gigabit transfers. So this is a customer use case of, of mine. Uh, it's an image processing app. Takes images in, uh, does some work on them, generates many, many, many different formats, loads them all up in S3. We're going to put a uh, public-facing ELB subnet layer here to terminate the customer traffic coming in. So that's the only thing open to the outside world. Obviously, the ELB is in uh, auto-scaling group. The web layer is in its own auto-scaling group that's automatically assigning public IP addresses to any new instances coming up. So customers come in. They upload their images. The processes take the images, create the formats. And the web servers are able to talk directly back out to S3 with their full instance bandwidth. The NAT is still there to perform any functions that those private servers still need. And this just kind of illustrates how simple it is to enable automatic public IP assignment for an autoscaling group. 
It's just that one little flag. So you still have a gnat in the picture. You have to make that available too. You can't just have one. So how do you do available gnat? And again, with automatic public IP assignment, it creates some interesting new ways to be able to do this. Um, very lightweight and headache-free, I consider, can, compared to the past. So um, this is my best practice rec recommendation, is one NAT per AZ, so that everything in that AZ is talking up through that single NAT, almost like columns. You create an autoscaling group per AZ for that NAT. And it's an autoscaling group we call an availability autoscaling group, or a CYA autoscaling group. And what it does is it's set to a minimum of one and a maximum of one, so that you are letting autoscaling monitor the health of that single instance. And if that instance goes away, autoscaling will take care of launching another one in its place. And autoscaling also supports public IP assignment, so it gets an IP automatically and it can start talking out. Now, the trick is, if that instance fails and it comes back up, obviously it's going to have a different instance ID. So all those routing tables that were formerly pointing to that instance ID name need to change, right? So how do you do that? And this is just uh, il illustrating what I was just talking about. So one subnet. So this is a, a, a little script I wrote, and it's really not much to it, and it kind of describes uh, the fun you can have with a programmable network. So the idea is that an instance comes up, it does very cloudy things, it asks, who am I, what's my name, where am I, what AZ, what, v what VPC, and what am I supposed to be doing? You drop this into user data script, it would configure your NAT, it would ask all those questions, it would search all the private subnets in your AZ that were tagged private, and any ones that were tagged private, it would edit the routing table to point to itself. Yeah? So you can see right there, we designate the name value for network private. And you'll also notice this is using uh, the latest and greatest version of our CLI, which allows some pretty cool functionality. So if you're, if you're a bash guy, um, the latest version will output to text, so you can actually use things like grep and awk, which before was all JSON, which was a little awkward, to say the least. Um, and it also has some built-in query functionality, so you can actually ask the API to return only the values you want, so you don't have to do a lot of parsing. And I'll make this whole script available. This is just a piece of it, but it'll be in the deck that we publish. And here's the role that would go along with it. So this is the EC2 role that you would apply to the instance itself that would give that instance the permissions to do what I just did. So obviously, we had a little fun with tagging. Tip number six is tag early, tag, tag often, tag everything. Um, you know, instance names and subnet IDs, and you know, these things are not friendly, nor are they good indicators of what relationship they have to other resources. But if you tag them with things that mean something to you, especially right at creation, later down the road, it will alleviate a lot of headache. So I recommend, just like I recommended thinking about IP space, think about tagging strategies. So whether it's you know, project codes or cost centers or environments or function of the server itself, whatever it is, come up with a schema and stick to it and, and do it on resource creation. And then the last point is, you know, if you start tagging things prod, make sure you tightly control who can actually do that, who can tag things prod. And finally, if, if, you're, if your design can't take advantage of, of the public IP assignment, talking straight out, and you still need to put a lot of stuff behind NATs that need high bandwidth streams, um, your option is this one. So scale, vertically scale your NAT instance per AZ. So stick with the HA NAT. You know, one per AZ, and scale that up. So different instance types obviously have different amounts of I.O., so if you move up the map to the M1X large and the C1X large, you'll get the maximum amount of bandwidth for that net. So let's talk a little bit about more than one VPC. So we have 
one VPC out there with the public facing web app. And now we're considering moving an internal corporate app up into the same region. Separate VPCs offer, offer you know, physically, I mean, logically separated and distinct networks. And for an in internal only application that's completely distinct, it seems to make sense. There's no dependencies between these two. It's a pretty easy decision. But what about when it's, it's not so clear? What should you be considering when you face the decision of putting something into a new VPC? So there are no hard and fast rules for when to evolve your design into multi-VPC. The tools are flexible, and they're designed to meet your requirements. But here are some of the most common customer use cases we see where customers decide to move to a multi-VPC model. So the first one is what we were just talking about today, distinct business applications that have no relationship to each other, and no dependencies. It's a pretty easy decision. Scope of audit containment. So if you have to say only these teams can, can access these prod resources, the only way to currently do that without the resource permissions across all API calls is to have distinct AWS accounts. So that would also obviously mean distinct VPCs. Risk level separation is kind of along the same line. So if you have you know, PCI applications or if you have confidential information in a certain system, and you want to isolate those off into separate VPCs. Um, production, non-production is pretty obvious. If you're running a multi-tenant application, you want to give each tenant their own VPC. And then finally, business unit alignment. We find many large enterprise customers that come to us that already have a very distinct internal network structure, structure that's aligned to their business units, and they model that with separate VPCs. So what should you be considering when you move to multi-VPCs? What causes the most headaches? And the first one is definitely knowing your inter-VPC traffic. So as soon as you logically isolate these networks, you need to know if there's any traffic dependencies between them, because you're going to have to account for that. Um, you know, there's ways to do that. Tying them in VPN tunnels is the most common one. But sometimes it's a very simple model if you're offering up just web services between different VPCs. It's very easy to offer up web services publicly, and they control the access of who can talk to who through those web services. But know that in advance before you get into it. Uh, I mentioned separate AWS accounts. You're going to need to, if you're going to have centralized operations groups to manage these multiple VPCs and you have separate accounts, you're going to have to think about things like IAM roles across the accounts to make sure you have consistent management and you're not having to reproduce the entire IAM structure for every VPC that you create. And finally, the VPC limits, just be aware of them. They're out there. Most of them are soft, but you don't want to hit them and then have to scramble to get them raised. There's a whole talk on this topic tomorrow at 11.30, so um, I kind of skimmed over and just gave the highlights, but there's a whole talk on multi-VPC paradigms, and some customers will come up and talk about that. So, controlling the border. So in our previous design, we were considering moving an internal corporate app up into the cloud. Except in this design, we want to keep it completely private and not provide any ability for instances in this private VPC to be able to talk out. So we'd like to not give it an IGW. So the design would Use a VPN tunnel back to your corporate data center. We've seen this route before. Unfortunately, this application needs to leverage S3. And um, there's no other way to do that except either IGW or, as we'll see in a minute. But you wouldn't be able to easily control at a network layer access out to S3. So, for example, with NACLs or even security groups, S3 is a constantly moving target as far as IP addresses are concerned. You know, we're constantly growing, constantly changing IPs, so you don't want to be chasing your tail trying to keep up with what defines S3 IP addresses. So it's general good cloud advice. You know, IPs come and go. DNS names are good. So 
Without an IGW, this is what your route would look like. Obviously not ideal, right? So what do you do? Um, one of the options is to put a proxy layer that separates your internal application from the IGW. So it would restrict all outbound HTTP, HTTPS traffic, and only allow traffic passing to specific URLs that you designate. There wouldn't be any routes in the private subnets to the IGW, and you would define at an instance by instance level in that instance's operating system, you'd define the proxy variable so that they'd actually be able to point to that proxy. And then you would add them all to a security group, those instances that you'd want access to the proxy, and that security group would be able to access the proxy layer. So let's look at that. The first thing we do is deploy an internal ELB to make sure this proxy layer is scalable and available. And that brings me to my seventh point. Put ELBs in their own subnets. Um, you might not have realized this, but ELBs take your IP addresses. They're EC2 instances in your VPC, and uh, if, if, you, if you need to define specific private IPs that you'd like to keep, you might come a day when you go to grab that private IP and it's actually not available to you. That might be because an EC2 instance has it that ELB is controlling. Um, there's rarely a situation where you'd actually blow out a subnet with ELB instances. You'd have to be pushing a large amount of traffic. I think the smallest subnet you can deploy an ELB in is 26-bit uh, subnet mass. So you know, that's uh, 62 hosts. That'd be a lot of traffic uh, that you'd be pushing. But it's good to keep them logically isolated. And, and, and back to my routing policy is distinct routing policies for those subnets. You don't uh, want a situation where you're mixing a routing policy for load balancing with a routing policy for your application layer. So with the ELB in place, we're going to deploy a proxy layer. I've chosen Squid for this. Again, like my NAT conversation, any proxy, any, any filtering device you want, any security appliance, but for this, we use Squid. So deployed between the internal application and the IGW. Obviously, the only thing that can talk to the Squids is the internal ELB. And the only thing that can talk to the internal ELB are those that are in the proxy security group I mentioned. So we have an auto-scaling group around the Squid instances, handing out public IPs automatically to them so that they are able to talk directly out. Requests are made, so those instances have their proxy variable set to point to the internal ELB DNS name. Distributes out to the proxy layers. Those proxy layers right now have a rule that says, I'm only allowing traffic to S3. And out you go. Now, remember the star that I mentioned earlier, because I'm depicting layers, right? But they're not really layers. So it's very important to make sure your security group configuration is spot on. Because the routing layers actually allow those private subnets to be able to talk at a routing perspective to the proxy subnet. But as long as your security groups are in place, that can't happen. So there you go. And here's just a, a very basic squid configuration file. And all it's doing is defining the CIDR blocks, the ELBs themselves, since those will be the only things talking to the proxies. Combining that with uh, a URL, destination check or a destination domain check for your specific S3 bucket, and then doing an AND on those. So those, both those things have to be true. You have to be coming from the ELB subnets, and you have to be going to the S3 bucket. If those two things are true, out you go. Otherwise, denial. Uh, there's a, actually an article on this, so CloudFormation templates, everything you need to try this out on the website. And this design could also be used in our earlier discussion when we were talking about scaling outbound traffic. As long as your traffic requirements are HTTP only, you know, the scaling proxy layer works for that too. 
So how about directory and name services in the VPC? So extending Active Directory, extending DNS up into your VPC. Right. <laughs> Not exactly the easiest thing to deal with, yeah? Um, you know, we automatically give these to you, but they're, they're not immediately useful in the way that our internal corporate friendly names are. So this is our new requirement. We want to be able to extend our internal Active Directory up into our new corporate application that has domain dependencies for it to work. So our plan is to launch domain controllers in this new VPC along with DNS so that new instances coming up can be given friendly names that are then automatically injected into the domain, the new machines are registered, all of these things flow down into your corporate directory, and you know, folks sitting on your internal network can reference these as if they were internal servers. And obviously DNS and everything would forward into your corporate DNS structure and resolve there. So before we go into the design of that, uh, I want to mention a few things about how DNS works in the VPC out of the box. So these are your two options available to you for VPC. With these two options enabled, you get these names. So that's the automatic assignment of host names for instances coming up. Uh, the one unique part is it works a little bit like uh, Core EC2 works. If you are given a public if you have a public IP address assigned to an instance and you get a public name, such as that first one, that one will, will resolve to the public IP address from the outside. If you call the same name from the inside the VPC, it'll give you back the private IP address. So it's kind of nice because you, you can be assured that you always get the right IP address. You're not going out and then back in to reach something that's inside your VPC. Um, the one thing I want to point out is that 10.1.0.2. That's the Amazon DNS service. So we provide a, uh, a virtualized DNS service to every VPC, and it takes the form of the .2 address for whatever CIDR you assign to your VPC. .2 is going to be the DNS service. And we call that Amazon Provided DNS. And the way to circumvent or not use Amazon Provided DNS in the VPC is to create your own DHCP option sets. So DHCP is the one thing in the VPC you actually can't replace. And you know, VPC has to be responsible for assigning IP addresses. It has to know where things live. Um, it, it has to be the one that gives IP addresses out. So you can't replace that. But you can replace DNS. So you do that by altering what DHCP hands out. So here you can see we're putting in our own corporate domain name. We're putting in the new I dedicated private IPs of the domain the DNS servers we plan to deploy. And you can create as many DHCP option sets as you want, but only one at a time can be applied to a VPC. If you change that set, it'll actually apply dynamically. So any leases that come up within the VPC will then get the new stuff from that new option set. Or if you want to force a lease refresh, you'll get all the new stuff too. So back to our model, now that we've updated our DHCP option sets. We've deployed two domain controllers, one in each subnet, registered them with our internal corporate domain. And now when an instance comes up with a friendly name, it knows where to go. It has DNS, checks DNS for its serve record, right? So it knows what domain controller to talk to, joins the domain that replicates down to your corporate forest and off you go. There's one little trick. Um, by removing Microsoft DHCP from the equation, you don't get automatic A and pointer records. So you'll get the A record, but you won't get the reverse. You won't get the pointer automatically. Unless you check these two boxes, put in your DNS suffix, or enforce this with the GPO, of course. Um, as long as those things are present, then anything joining, you'll get both sides of the records. So you'll get your A and your, and your pointer. And this is just a sample PowerShell script you would throw into user data to do this. Um, this takes whatever you put in the name tag for the EC2 instance. It takes that as the friendly name, registers that as the machine name in the domain, 
obviously registers the machine in the domain, and then reboots. Um, you'll notice I actually left the credential strings in there, which you can decide whether that's best practice or not. There's many different ways to do this, but this is the easy way to do it. Um, I created a, 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 a domain user that only could add machines, so that's one thing. But you could put this in a secure file. I mean, there's many ways you could sec secure this better than, than putting a password string into this sh shell script. And this just illustrates what a DNS query would now look like. So you query your local DNS within the VPC. It's set its forwarding DNS configuration to be your corporate domain D DNS. If that DNS didn't have it cached, off you go to the internet back. So completely circumventing the Amazon DNS. And again, we have uh, quite a few uh, examples of this for SharePoint, for Exchange, of how to deploy Active Directory uh, in the cloud. All right, bringing it all back home. So now we've got public-facing web app. Now we have this internal corporate application in its own VPC. It's now tied into your domain controllers back home. And what's next? So it turns out this internal corporate app was pretty popular. And now everyone wants one where you had two VPCs. I have five, 10, 20, who knows. If you continue to use VPNs for this, obviously you're creating customer gateway endpoints on your end. So if you have VPN endpoints on your, in, in this example, we have a pair of HA, and, HA pair of VPN endpoints. You're creating a customer gateway for every single one of these VPCs. Every one of those customer gateways has to have a public IP address assigned to it. And it starts to become a bit of an administrative headache, especially if you're pushing a large amount of traffic. So you know, you've got to have some pretty good gear if these, these individual VPN tunnels are starting to push multi-gigabit traffic. Um, obviously, that's some top-end gear, some expensive stuff. This is one model. I have several customers who've gone this way. So they collapse inwards, do the hub and spoke, have a centralized VPC that provides common services like logging and monitoring. And then all the other satellite VPCs are running EC2 endpoints that run VPN software that connect into the, into the VGW of the central VPC. And this works to a certain extent, but you also have to be comfortable with managing VPN infrastructure. Because every one of those VPCs now has, at least, hopefully, two EC2 endpoints, you know, an HA pair of of VPN devices that you're now managing. You know, you're managing some kind of dynamic routing protocol between all these hub and spokes, OSPF or BGP. So there's, there's a bar there, and it's, it can be a headache. And again, if that single tunnel going back down to you is also high bandwidth, at a certain point, you're going to start pushing the, the limits. So Direct Connect a private fiber connection service, simplifies a lot of this. You, know, you can get a direct connection into the region, whether it's 50 to 500 megabits, which is actually brand new. We've announced sub at one gigabit speeds for direct connect. One gigabit pipes, 10 gigabit pipes, or multiples thereof. You can get, it's almost like the direct connect location acts like a mega customer gateway, right? and you define all the interfaces on that single customer gateway. So a few more bits on Direct Connect. You can create virtual interfaces. So you create private logical interfaces on the Direct Connect and associate with them with the VPCs. So one per VPC. You can also create public interfaces to AWS, so access public resources in that AWS region over Direct Connect. Obviously, the consistent network performance, latency, it's a dedicated connection. There's at least one location associated to each region. Some regions have two. And what we do is we extend private fiber from the AWS region to these Direct Connect locations. And usually, these Direct Connect locations, they're Equinix or CoreSight. These are, are large colos that have a 
a concentration of customers already. So um, there's a good chance you're already there. And it's a very simple process to just get patched into us. If you're not there, we have a whole uh, environment ecosystem of partners that provide the last mile services to get you there. And obviously, we always re recommend redundant connections. And as you saw before, if you don't go redundant connections and you only have a single direct connect line, but you also have VPN, you can do that as a backup. And the VGW will always favor that direct connect connection. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So here's our first VPC, one VGW. We create that private virtual interface. We give it a unique VLAN tag. The BGP is, ASN is actually, that's Amazon's, that's AWS's, 7224. Out of that interface will be advertised the CIDR block you've assigned to the VPC. And then obviously you give the interface itself an IP address. Here I've used uh, a link local address, but it can, you can put whatever IP address, private IP address you want here. And this is what you define on your end. So notice the most important part is these VLAN tags are identical because that is what determines this layer two virtual pipe across the direct connect that extends the VPC into your network. Uh, the BGP ASN on your end can be, if you have a public one, you can use it or you can just use a private one. Um, there's no worries there. It's a it's a it's a one-to-one -one connection. You can also obviously you're you're announcing whatever you want over that connection. And same for the next one. The only thing different is the VLAN tag, distinct and unique for that connection, and the BGP announcement is for that VPC. And again, I've used a different BGP ASN on your end. That's not required. I just did that to make it distinct on these configurations. And on we go. Right? Every single one gets its own pipe. And every VPC now goes over the same physical connection. Now, when it comes to routing, this is what the table starts to look like on your end. But we don't do any routing between interfaces on our end. It literally is a layer two connection all the way to you. So routing decisions must be made on your end. So when you start to do intra VPC routing, say if you want VPC1 to talk to VPC4, those packets come down to you, you make the decision, and it goes back out. So just like this. Yeah. And so now all the VPCs can talk to each other. You know, there's no VPN tunnels, there's no encryption layers. They're all routing between each other. And according to your routing policy. Which bring me, brings me to tip number eight is to know your routing database. So in order to see what the VGW sees, a little thing I do is I, I create a, a separate routing table. I don't assign it to anything. And I enable what we call route propagation. So you enable route propagation on a routing table. And that means that routing table now sees whatever BGP announcements come on the other side of the VGW are populated into the VPC by the VGW. So as soon as you enable that on the routing table, you're going to get all the networks that you see over that connection. So it's just a nice way to keep a clean record of exactly what you're seeing of all your internal CIDR blocks, and also the CIDR blocks of your other VPCs if you're announcing out all of those BGP networks over your uh, separate VPC connections. So we talked about private virtual interfaces to all these VPCs, but you can also have a public one. So just like we created before, you can create a public interface to the public AWS. The only difference now is, instead of advertising out the VPC CIDR block, we're announcing out whatever public CIDR blocks are associated with that region. The only difference is, on your end, it's a public connection. So you need to treat it as such. It's the internet, basically. Um, so we don't do any NAT or any functionality on there. That's something you have to do on your end. And obviously, the security layer between that and your internal network would be handled by you. But now we have an actual designation for the public AWS and a routing table. So everything AWS related, whether it's S3 or even Amazon.com, would go over this connection. So here I represent some kind of NAT-PAT security layer that would front this interface. 
And the same deal. If you wanted to reach S3 now, you could leverage Direct Connect to do that. The packets would come down to you through Direct Connect and go back out over the public interface. But it's absolutely doable. And you, know, you might even get better latencies depending on, upon how close you are to the Direct Connect facility. And this is just illustrating the same with your internal network, straight out the public to S3. So this is what it might look like from a physical perspective, where you have your routers. We say customer routers, but these could also be your telco provider routers. Whatever it is that gets you the last mile into that facility, that direct connect location, if you're not actually there yourself already. And here we have redundant connections, and we tie them together with BGP multipathing. So they're active, active, load balanced. We support all the standard BGP stuff. So if you want to do meds, if you want to do local preference, we support all of that. We also support BFD, so bidirectional forwarding detection for fast link failover. We support that too. And it starts to get really fun when you start leveraging your own network. So say you have your own MPLS cloud. You can terminate that at each Direct Connect location, if that's a region you want to get to. And you start tying in the regions to your, to your cloud, to your, you know, your internal cloud. And so each AWS region just becomes another spoke on your internal hub. And every resource in every region can talk to each other. VPCs in Europe can now talk to VPCs in Virginia. And there you go, you know, global VPC domination. <laughs> I just realized this slide looks like missile command. That was not intentional, but I like it. <laughs> so here's all we've covered. There's a lot of stuff. Thank you for your patience. Uh, one thing I want to mention, VPC is free. I mean, how cool is that? CloudFormation is free. Uh, the only thing you pay for with VPC is the, a port charge for a VPN connection. So it's five cents an hour for any active VPN tunnels you have. But beyond that, all the features and functionality we discussed are free.